Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for, uh, I just want to say thank you to Sullivan University for having me here today. Uh, first, um, you know, I was here not too long ago, and um, I was, uh, you know, when I was in that seat, I was extremely inspired to uh, move forward with my career. Now that I'm an executive chef, I, I have not stopped. Um, it's something that is, uh, you know, it's, it's something I'm going to constantly progress at, and uh, hopefully I can, you know, have several restaurants. Um, I don't think I'll, I'll stop, you know, and uh, it's, just, it's just an honor to be here with um, my mentors and, you know, the teachers that really have given me the foundation and the basics. Uh, and I think, you know, even if you have to get away from school for a minute, it's always important to finish. So uh, I just want to start out and talk a little bit about um, just kind of how I got started in cooking. Everybody has a story, right? Everybody's got a story. Everybody's got a passion, idea of why you're here, right? Everybody has a vision. So how it started was I was a poor kid. I was um, 10, 11 years old. My uh, mom was dating a chef, and uh, he had his own restaurant. And I started working there. Uh, I was 11, 12 years old. Uh, I was prep cook, uh, so I was prepping, uh, mowing the grass, weed eating, cleaning down smokers, all this stuff. And then basically they gave me a $20 bill and that's it, you know, so it was good. Learned some work ethic. Uh, from there, I basically cooked for my twin brother and I. Uh, parents were at home and uh, it was kind of a passion, you know, it's a time that uh, basically everybody kind of had fun and got along. So um, from there, by the time I was, uh, 16 years old, I, was, I, I went to another restaurant uh, when I was 14, and then by 16, I had keys um, to the restaurant. And then after that, uh, basically, I just kept on progressing, and, and I basically cooked all the way until I was about 22, 23 years old before I attended culinary school. Um, I will say that even though that I had a lot of knowledge, or a lot of basic knowledge, uh, or, or, or I should say a comfortable foundation, uh, I still w did not have the basic knowledge that I needed to progress to move further. Um, and so that's what was so important about going to Sullivan, is actually following through with knowing that and then beating, uh, beating it in my head to know the basics. And I didn't understand it so much when I was in your seats because I was just like, damn it, they gotta calm down about the basics. Like, you know, like this is, <laughs> like, I get it uh, already. Um, but now that you know I'm, I'm a teacher as well, is that I truly, truly understand it more now, um, and I do believe that if you know the basics, you can cook anything you ever would imagine, and I really, really believe that. Um, there's not one thing that I cannot cook. There's not one thing, um, because it's it's starting about building a, a relationship with it. So, um, so basically, from there on, um, when I was after after I graduated, I went to California. After California. Worked with a few cool chefs there. Went to Nashville. Mom had breast cancer. Cruised to Nashville. Worked with another chef named Sean Brock. That was a fun experience. Fast forward, after he left, 26 years old, I go ahead and I open up a restaurant. Um, so I opened up a restaurant called Flight World Dining and Wine. And it was a 220 seat restaurant in my first executive chef position. So it was crazy. Uh, I took 11 days off in two and a half years, and um, we won 18 awards. After that, I had the opportunity to go to the Oak Room, and uh, I was able to get three Five Diamond Awards under my belt. And then currently, two years ago, I got out of that and opened up a restaurant in the Nulu District off East Market called Le Coupe Bistro. Um, now that I'm with Le Coupe Bistro, I'm also opening up two more restaurants this year. Uh, one of them is in Nashville. It's called Union Common. Union Common is going to be a small plate restaurant. And it's, uh, it's kind of our little gimmick thing of small plates, big steaks. Uh, one thing I will touch on is that if you are going to do your thing, okay, it's going to take time. Be patient. But if you do and when you do, have your own identity, okay? Just have your own identity. It doesn't matter what you're doing, okay? It doesn't matter if you're trying to do wood burning grill or you're trying to do all, you know, uh, you're focusing on one type of technique, just have your own identity, okay? Um, so, so what I wanna talk about um, just for a second is, um, is really working, okay? 
it's very, very important that, uh, that you start working now, okay? If, any, if you don't have any experience, I know this is gonna sound um, almost borderline crazy, but start out as a dishwasher, okay? I started out as a dishwasher, and if I didn't, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Um, I remember going to New York, and when I went to New York, I went to, I knocked on a bunch of doors and I couldn't get a job. I couldn't even get a job in Nashville, actually, at the time. And uh, I, went to, I went to New York, and, um, and I knocked on doors and knocked on doors, and, and I just looked at the chef, and I said, may I speak to the chef? And the sous chef's like, no, no, chef, chef doesn't talk to anybody. So I was like, oh. So anyways, uh, I got a job, actually, washing dishes for three days, and I went to prep cooking. Um, and so that was uh, just a valuable experience. You know, and, and going with that is that, you know, when you're, when you're constantly progressing with your career, you're gonna go through tough times. This business is not easy. You know, if it was easy, everybody would do it. I mean, if, if it was easy, there would be a million students, you know, um, but it's not easy. It's a, it's a challenge no matter what you're trying to accomplish. So um, I do wanna go ahead and, and talk about um, the 10 steps that I think about pretty much throughout the day of cooking, okay? There's 10 steps that are, I think that would help you when you're in the kitchen, okay? And I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna get a little bit more in depth with this um, here in just a few, and I will get to cooking, I promise, but I want everybody to understand what we're trying to accomplish with the food and how we're gonna get there, okay? Because anybody can, anybody, can pretty much follow a recipe, yeah? Right? And so I'm not really concerned about that because I think that when everybody graduates here, right, everybody's gonna, everybody's gonna follow a recipe and it's like, okay, what I wanna teach you today, what I want to really expand your minds with is to really understand how to study your ingredients, okay? So what we're gonna do is, 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 is one is to understand what you're working with, okay? So it's understanding your ingredient, okay, as a whole. Okay, and it's really, I'm talking about whole ingredients. I'm talking about, it could be this orange. It could be looking at this orange and saying, okay, how many techniques can we do with this? You know, well, we know that we can juice it. We know that we can serve segments, of course. Um, we know we can do, uh, you know, aspic or jellies, right? With this, we know there's, there's sky's the limit. What do we do with the peel? You know, can we do something with the peel? Can we make a sauce out of the peel? You know, it's, it's to go a little bit further with what we're, uh, you know, what we're trying to uh, accomplish there. And so, you know, it's understanding, it's building relationship, it's having respect for your ingredients. Um, it's how to handle your ingredients, you know, it's, it's respecting it, it's constantly tasting, it's understanding each element of what every single thing tastes like. Um, and having the finesse behind that product. So everything's all about mise en place, and I'm sure you've heard that a million times as well, right? So. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit further and following through to the next step. So your mise en place currently today is your mise en place for a recipe, yeah? So you put everything together and it's a recipe. And then when you leave your kitchen, the kitchen is its own mise en place, right? Because you have everything in its own place, correct? Okay, so that's what I want to talk about is when you are trying, when you're thinking about mise en place, it goes a little bit deeper than that, okay? It goes with your mise en place going from, okay, everything is in front of you, everything's there, everything has its own place, but now how is it handled? You know, is it, is it thrown together or is it done with finesse? And so, um, and to go with next thing is, is really to keep uh, your focus on working with whole ingredients, natural, um, seasonal, uh, keep them food pure, you know, uh, when you're in the kitchen too, is focusing on yourself, but also focusing on everybody around you. I think something that's important is that, you know, something that I did when I was in culinary school that, that uh, really benefited me to this day is, is trying to become um, more observant, okay? To the point where when someone says behind you, you already know it up here, but you're glad that they still said it. Because being observant is, it, it's, it's extremely important, you know, in, in the kitchen of really trying to be observant because what happens is this, is like, I'm gonna learn from you, right? So if you're, if you're doing something in front of me, and say you worked at a restaurant down the street, well, they may be doing something that I've never seen before. 
and now you're doing it. So I'm like working across from you, and I'm like, wow, what is she doing? Oh, okay, cool. Well, mentally, I learned that, right? But everybody has notebooks in the kitchen, right? Right? Okay, so what do you do? When you see something that someone else is doing, you can write it down. I'm going to check this shit out later. I'm Googling that, you know? And that's, I mean, it's important because that's how you learn. That's how you constantly progress every day. You learn what you learn, and then you learn what everybody else learns. So the best advice is, you know, when you're in the kitchen, focus on yourself and what you're trying to accomplish and build that relationship with your food, that recipe, making sure your chef's happy. And at the end of the day, when you go home, you should have a notebook that has notes throughout that day. One thing I will say is this, is that everybody carry a notebook. Where's your notebooks? Do you have notebooks out now? Little notebooks, small ones? Y'all need to get pocket notebooks. There you go, all right. So pocket notebooks are important, okay? Um, if you ever walk into a kitchen, please do not show up to that kitchen with a blank notebook. Please don't because I have no idea where you're at. I don't think any chef has an idea where you're at if you show up to, if you show up to a kitchen with a blank notebook, what, what do they know about you? How do I know how to teach you? You gotta be able to really help your chef kind of halfway, let him understand who you are a little bit, what your vision is, what you're trying try to accomplish, whether it's opening up a hot dog stand, you know, a burger joint, a casual fine dining restaurant, a steakhouse, it doesn't matter, you know, it's just, really trying to focus on that. Um, I'll give you a couple pointers too, a couple, some books to read that will help you through these steps. Um, so what helps with the basics is, uh, of course, you're on food and cooking. Um, read that all the time. Read it all the time. Read it until you memorize the pages. Seriously. I remember sauces used to be on page 216. That's what I remember, right? And that's what you need to remember because that's basics, okay? So um, that, another one is Food Lover's Companion. Really, really good on some basic knowledge. Um, when you get into creating dishes, understanding seasonal food, um, culinary artistry is fun. It's dated. It is dated, but it's fun. I think it's important, though, because you can't believe everything on the internet. So, um, of course, The French Laundry is a very inspirational book. Really, really focused on a lot of finesse. Um, what Einstein told his cooks is another book. That's really, really cool because it actually talks about the precise cooking of eggs and meat. Um, it's, it's really, really cool. And then also um, there's uh, a day at El Bulli pretty much will actually sum everything up together because it has every single part of that element in it. Um, so, we're saying that is this right here is that let's talk about this cauliflower. Okay. We're first going to talk about cost. Okay. Is everybody ready for numbers? We should have got some music in here, huh? We should just live this place up. All right. So we're going to talk numbers. Okay. My brain works numbers. I can't spell worth a damn, but I know numbers. Okay. Um, we want to talk about, first of all, why we are trying to focus on what we're doing, okay? So right now we have a lot of proteins, okay? This will age myself for a second, but when I was, when I was sitting down, what happened was is that I could graduate school, I could buy a prefabricated protein, and it was excellent because uh, it, didn't, it didn't really cost that much, it cut labor, there's a lot of things that that factor in that. Now, the, you know, proteins are extremely expensive. So what's happening is, does everybody keep up with what's going on in the culinary world right now in food? Does everybody know what's going on West Coast? Radiation? Okay. So there's a radiation issue in the West Coast, so we have some fish issues, right? Um, some people are still skeptical about the Gulf, right, because of the BP spill. And then also you have um, everything's going to be coming out of the Northeast, right? Which that's going to be a supply and demand issue, correct? All right. So now we also just signed a deal and we are actually, you know, shipping our hogs overseas. So now we have pork and now we also have a drought which affects beef. So I'm sitting over here like, damn, because I'm telling you this much, 
you guys are in for it. That's why you guys got to know this. Is because it's a different game. It's a different game now what you guys are getting into compared to what I was getting into when I graduated. Okay? And what I mean by that is that now you're dealing with a different expense. Okay? So now we got to figure out this. What are we going to do to impress our guests? Because at the end of the day, that's all that matters because our guests are going to pay us, right? And we're going to go home and that's how we take care of ourselves, right? Because our guests pay us, all right? So what we're going to talk about is this. Is so, you know, we, we, we've talked about building a relationship, right? And we'll continue to talk about that in just a second. But this is what I want you to understand. So everybody knows that this cauliflower right here is pretty much what everybody uses, right? It's pretty much what everybody's accustomed to, correct? And is everybody accustomed to this? Yeah? No? Yeah? Half? Okay, cool. Um, so let's talk about this first. All right, so this, how, does anybody know how much this is at the grocery store? No? Okay. How much? Almost $3. It's close. Okay. So the thing is, is that it's important. What I would do, it's very, very important to, to understand cost. This, I mean, seriously, you've got to brainwash yourself and understand cost. Because that's what's going to make you survive. You can cook the best food in the world, but if you can't make money at it, you're done. There's someone else trying to fill your shoes. Okay? So this right here right now, currently through the restaurant, is a $1.92. Okay? This is $1.92 right now as, uh, as of just yesterday. $1.92 each. Okay? So if we can spread this out, $1.92 on several dishes, that truly helps, right? Because we're going to do some math in a minute. That's right. I, hey, it's not easy with me. I'm a numbers guy, so that's what happens. OK, this one is actually pretty much double, OK? Because the tricolors, they are $3.81, OK? So now that we know how much that cost, right? We're going to go ahead and we're going to talk about basically labor cost, food cost, real, real quick. Okay? Nothing goes in the trash, right? Do we understand that? Just the root. And that's if that. Because you can wash roots and do things with that some. Garlic root is nice. Garlic root, if you clean it, you fry it at 225 until it's golden and let it sit and get nice and crispy. Actually, adds some nice bitter flavor if you're doing anything that has a little natural sweetness to it. Okay? That's kind of fun because you're not throwing that away. Um, so, so that's pretty much, you know, that's, we're not, we're not going to focus on, on wasting anything. So let's talk about this cooking cauliflower, okay? So cauliflower is pretty much one of the only vegetables that grows and when it grows, it grows um, just as much as height as width, okay? It's the same height and width. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? I think that's pretty amazing to me how a cauliflower grows. It kind of blows my mind a little bit. It's like, why doesn't it grow more, you know? Um, so anyway, so it was actually introduced. Uh, cauliflower was introduced to France, okay? Back in the 16th century, okay? Uh, Italy went ahead and was like, here, we're going to go ahead and give you something because we're, we're sad. We've been stealing everything, you know. Everybody steals stuff, you know. It's either Italians, uh, French, or uh, Japan. You know, they all want to steal from each other. So anyways, what happened was is that, um, so that's, that's more cauliflower in France now. It's actually more of a delicacy, okay. Um, it is still in gardens. Okay, it's still uh, grown in gardens, but it's actually treated more as a delicacy. Okay, but what we're going to talk about is that, you know, this is, this is the one in France, okay? This one right here, this is pretty awesome right here because this is actually known as a cheddar, okay? It's known as cheddar cauliflower, and it's actually started out in Canada, okay? But you can find it in the United States today. And then this right here is purple. This is more of a, this is what they wanted, of course, you know, they, it's Asia, okay? It's like I said, everybody wants, everybody wants a piece. So this is a tropical cauliflower. And then this is right here, also known as a Brocca flower or Romanesco, okay? 
And so, I'm dropping stuff now. So, that, so that's that right there, okay? What's nice about cauliflower is that it's low in fat, okay? It's low in fat, and this is very, very important right now that I'm, I'm getting into this is because now we're going to talk about health a little bit, okay? We all know what's going on. Um, what is going on is that people are really, really focused on gluten-free menus now. They're, people become more health conscious. There is a movement now that is a true Farm to Table movement, okay? I know that you've been here in Farm to Table for the past, past five years. Maybe that's why some of you are actually here is because of this Farm to Table movement, but that's what's going on now. So uh, what cauliflower does is it protects against cancer, okay? It's got uh, sulfurane, okay? Sulfurane is actually the cell that's in the cauliflower and actually um, fights against prostate cancer, okay? So, and so that's huge. It also really, really um, enhances DNA repair and then it also, um, you know, helps the, slowing the growth of cancer cells, okay? So, and that's what I mean about studying your ingredient because what's gonna happen is this, is that you want to study it to the point where you know every single thing about it. If it's gonna be your focal point too. As much as possible, the more knowledge you have is better and you still won't know everything. I study every single day of my life, every day. And I, I feel like I don't know anything half the time. So, um, cooking methods, okay? Cooking methods, we have, uh, you can steam it. Steam it, when you steam cauliflower, it does actually keep those cells more, okay? So it is healthier, okay? It's gonna, it's gonna keep that so it fights more, okay? Um, but you also have, you have roasted, fried, raw, and boiled, okay? Now, what we're gonna experience is we're gonna focus on raw, and we're gonna focus on uh, roasted, pickled, and um, boiled. Boiled, we're gonna do a soup, all right? So that's the, that's the first thing we're gonna focus on is the raw, okay? Um, so with this raw, okay, I'm getting ready, it's getting ready to get passed out. I'm gonna have, have you try every single step, okay? And after we try every single step of this, we're gonna bring everything together. Okay, and so what I ask is if you guys can just take one and just pass it down. Okay, um, what we're gonna do is the first, um, first what we wanna do is we want you to taste this raw. We want you to understand what the cauliflower truly tastes like, okay? You always really wanna try everything in its raw state, okay? Now, if you're ever testing meats, for an example, because I know that we're gonna get off subject for just a hair, but what I mean by raw is it's, it's very, very important. So like if you're testing the meat, just use salt. Salt, no oil, no butter, just salt in a, in a grill. Okay, then you can taste the true uh, essence of the meat. So, and that goes with fish as well. So um, back here to the raw though, is that what we wanna do is we wanna understand what, what, what we can do with this raw. So in this raw state, we're also, now that we're tasting it, um, we also wanna understand what we can do with it. Okay, so there are, some methods you can go ahead and take this you could toss that raw cauliflower a little oil salt right and you can actually put it in a low heat oven and then after a low heat oven dehydrator make yourself nice some nice crispy cauliflower chips okay um so does everybody have this cauliflower is it good close okay so Basically, we're gonna, we'll go from the raw, and now we're gonna talk about the roasted, okay? We're gonna get into the roasted cauliflower. Okay, so the, 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 what you'll know first is that, so it's pretty versatile, right? Does anybody like cauliflower, by the way? Everybody good with cauliflower? Well, that's good. All right, excellent. Okay, so let's talk about cauliflower real quick. Um, so the raw, it's nice, it's clean. It tracks well to lots of flavors, whatever you want to use. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, we're going to go into the raw right now. Go to raw. We're going to go into the raw. I mean, the, the roasted. Yeah, roasted. Go. Okay, so what we do with the roasted is that it's real, this is it's pretty simple here. And this is what I mean by building recipes, okay? Because I think it's very, very, very important is this. First is that when you're dealing with um, peppercorns, a lot of um, 
basically spices. Just go ahead and toast them off. Okay. Anybody know that? Everybody know toast off all? Okay, good. Okay, so we're gonna basically some white, some white peppercorns, okay, and coriander. Cracked, some cracked red, a little salt. What you're about to try is this right here. Salt, pepper, and some turmeric. Okay, so what we do is go ahead, we saute that, get nice, toasted, a little turmeric, and after it's tossed, we go ahead and we pulse it in a Vita Prep, okay? So we pulse it in a Vita Prep, gives it more of a nice, smooth texture. What we're gonna use is we're gonna use some good olive oil. So what we'll do is I'll take some cauliflower is real simple and this is what I'm saying like there's low labor and low food cost so it's it, it hits both okay so basically it's just cauliflower and what we'll do is just some good olive oil okay just some good tasty olive oil whatever you want to try okay and then besides that we'll just go a little we'll season it right a little salt a little pepper, and then a little spice. So after we go ahead and we toss it, right? What I like to do, another, uh, another thing we can do is that let it marinate. Let it marinate for overnight, okay? Marinates overnight, it's gonna introduce more flavor, okay? So you can let it marinate overnight, Toss it, okay? After you toss it next day, you can add a little bit more olive oil the next day to it. Just like we did this morning. And then we can roast it off, okay? You put it on a sheet tray. If you like to, you can actually put a rack down and then a sheet tray, okay? After that, we roast it off till it's a little golden. We toss it with some cilantro and some orange zest. Okay, you guys taste the cilantro and orange zest? Okay, so it's simple, right? Not, not bad, not bad. So, any questions so far? Go ahead. I mean, color is great. I mean, with turmeric, there's color, but what I like about uh, turmeric is it's got a lot of earth. And so, you know, when I'm trying to think about every single ingredient that I am actually cooking with or using, I'm thinking about how to elevate each ingredient. So I want earth. I want some spice. Um, I definitely want acid. I want to make sure it's seasoned properly. And whether it's a, some kind of, you know, fat, you know, uh, it could be, um, could be a coconut oil. It could be pork fat. It could be olive oil. It could be just, um, you know, it's pretty much sky's the limit. And that's what that's what it is with us is that with this cauliflower it's just gonna every flavor is accentuating each other every flavor is gonna lift it it's kind of like you know you can put orange zest in there and that's great but that it's not gonna lift until you put that cilantro in there when you put the cilantro in there it's actually gonna lift um, the orange zest and it's gonna give it some lift so then you'll have that acid you'll have some acid bitter spice earth and then you have that that, that finish of olive and, uh, and then basically your palate's going on a roller coaster ride with just a piece of cauliflower. So now this cauliflower, you can use it for anything, okay? So, you know, with this, um, you can do, you know, with, with cauliflower, what's nice is because sky's the limit and it's inexpensive. So if you want, you could do a mashed cauliflower. You can do, if you want to go a little out there, you could do a cauliflower um, creme brulee and do a cauliflower custard. You could do, um, you know, a cauliflower pizza crust if you wanted to. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's studying the ingredients to the point where the sky's the limit. You can do anything. And so, one thing that I'm working on right now is a uh, cauliflower tater tot, actually. I know it sounds funny. But the thing is, it's kind of the whole perception. So it's, you know, it's, it's studying the psychology of things. So what we're doing is we're going to take a tater tot that's extremely not healthy, and we're going to make you think it's healthy. So <laughs> that's kind of what we're doing there. So, um, so, so let's move on. We're going to move on to 
we're going to move on to um, to pickling. Okay. Now, pickling is fun. Okay. Has everybody pickles here before? You like pickling? Okay. Pickling is fun because what's nice about pickling is that uh, it preserves. Okay. Everybody knows that your restaurant's not busy all the time. Okay, right? But what's also nice about it is that it also is going to enhance your dish, okay? It's going to give it some lift, okay? And it also is great with fat. Any, anything that's pickled is absolutely wonderful with fat. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this, and this is going to be fun. It's a fun, fun little dish here. So what we're going to do is that when, when we pickle, we want to make sure that we heat it up, right? And so what we're going to do, all right, it's on, it's ready to roll. Okay, so when we're pickling this, what I like to do is I like to start out with sugar, okay? And the reason why is because we're going to treat it almost like a caramel, right? Who's the pastry people here? Oh, there's a lot of y'all. <laughs> oh, man. This is a dark side in here. This is a dark side. They tricked y'all. Don't even move to culinary. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so. <laughs> All right, right field. All right, so, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going like to uh, treat like a caramel. Okay? And so I like to go ahead and toast off my sugar. Okay? And what we're going to do is with toasting off the sugar, I like to go ahead and toast everything else off, okay? Because I like to get everything, you know, feeling really, really sexy. So what we're going to do is we have a little, uh, couple, a little bit of star anise, right? Star anise doesn't hurt anybody, right? Um, we'll put a little bit of thyme in here. This thyme doesn't hurt. Okay. Put a little fennel, a little fennel pollen. Fennel seed, a little fennel seed, and a little bit more. Okay, and we're gonna go with uh, some cinnamon stick, fresh bay leaf. Okay, I like fresh bay leaf. Fresh bay leaf is fun. Um, one example is I know that a lot of people use uh, dry bay leaf. Um, dry bay leaf is fun. It's just a little flat. Okay, it's good for grandmas. Uh, stew and roast and I mean sure it's good for stocks too um, at times one thing that I do like about fresh bay leaf though is that you can keep it in the freezer and it will never die okay and you can keep it in some small increments but it's much more floral okay and it actually enhances that bay leaf just a little bit more okay kind of you know how when you taste bay leaf in something you always taste it in part of it but you don't taste it throughout and that's kind of what this is doing Okay, this will do it throughout. So we're gonna put a little fresh bay leaf in there. Okay, and you can see it's starting to caramelize a little bit, but I'm gonna speed up the process here for a minute because this will be here all day. So um, we'll go ahead, we're gonna go with a little bit of uh, white wine vinegar. Okay. Good. I'll wake you up in here. I'll wake you up. All right, so. That, we're also gonna go with a little balsamic. Okay, some beet juice. We juiced some beets earlier. Some beet juice. I'm gonna go with a little bit of Grand Marnier, cause, everybody like to drink in here? Yes. Yeah? That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yeah, y'all need a drink, seriously, but, um, yeah, y'all need a drink in this business. Um, no, but seriously, just learn how to drink. Is that's that's the most important thing. Seriously, learn how to drink. Um, and that the reason why I say that is because uh, now I'm a snob, so I won't drink anything that's cheap. Like y'all drink cheap stuff right now. I know y'all are vodka fans, right? Oh, so anyways, no, that's cheap stuff. So, um, but learn how to drink. You know, learn really study it. You know, and because every single bit of it can enhance your food as well. Uh, but just don't use the expensive stuff in the dishes. Anyways, we're going to go with a little bit of Grand Marnier. Why not? A little bit more. Why not? And, and so anyways, what we'll do is we're going to make our pickling liquid. And what's nice about pickling liquid is 
another thing is that the pickling liquid, you want to go ahead and after you make your pickling liquid, um, let it set, okay? Let it set for at least a day if you can, okay? If you can't, I understand, I get it, but let it set for a day and then what you want to do is you want to strain it, reheat it again, and then pickle, okay? Because you're going to introduce a lot more flavor that way, okay? You're going to let everything um, breathe. It's almost like tasting a soup or, or your mom, you know, your mom's pot roast or grandma's pot roast. Uh, the next day, everything tastes better. And the same thing. So we're going to let these flavors marry. Um, after it's strained, after, you, after this is done, you can go ahead and strain it again, okay? And then after it's strained again, we're going to go ahead, you put your cauliflower in, and you let it cool down, okay? Just as simple as that, all right? After that, um, next day you're ready to eat it. So as far as the pickling goes, what do you think? Acid? You taste the high lifting acid? Okay, good. What else do you taste? Do you taste everything so far? Does that make sense? Okay. So let's, let's go on to the next thing, okay? Um, real quick, before I do that, any questions so far? Again, any questions? Yes. What's the herb that's So uh, first bay leaf or the thyme? Right here? Star anise? Yeah. Here you go. Go ahead and smell that. Just, just stare at it for a while, you know? <laughs> Seriously, I'm serious. My wife makes fun of me all the time. She goes, in the, she goes in the living room and I'm just staring at stuff. I'll just be like staring at this orange just like this right here the whole time. <laughs> just trying to figure it out. Just trying to figure it out, you know? Um, no, I, I do that seriously. It's funny because I, um, and that I, I do because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very, I get excited about these ingredients and I try to figure out um, really how to spread them out through my menu without it being too aggressive. Like I don't want, I want to be able to use cauliflower on my menu three or four times. Like if I buy a case, I want to use it in three or four years without it being too aggressive to the point where people um, think that I'm using it three or four times, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so next, um, any questions? There's got to be questions. No questions so far? Oh, come on. What's that? Uh, juicer. What we do is peel the, peel the beets. After we, we do not. We do not. Um, I, I peel the beets, and after I peel my juicer. Just make sure you skim the top off, because it will be a nice pink top all the air um so yeah um any other questions uh what dishes do you use pick one i use you know pickle and cauliflower right now currently at the restaurant um over at the Le Coupe bistro we actually pair it with cheese actually um because um our cheese and charcuterie and the reason why is because well charcuterie of course it's classic right but um but we do it with cheese because of that fat. And I think that when you're eating these different types of cheeses, it's nice to kind of give your palate a break. It's like, ah, uh, and then you go ahead and you go to the next one and the next one. So it's kind of fun. So yeah. Uh, I see the way you study each Um, you know, it, it all starts out about my guests first. Um, I used to cook with my ego like that, actually. Um, I, I use that as an example of cooking with your ego, because cooking with your ego is, is no boundaries to the point where you're going to confuse your guest. Okay? And the first thing I want to do is pull myself back, and I don't want to confuse my guest. I want to be able to give them something that they can experience that they already have an, an idea about. And so that's the very first thing. Like if I use cauliflower, I'm like, okay, cool. I'm gonna use cauliflower in this and it's gonna be fun. But if I needed to, for example, if I needed to, if I had the stems, for example, okay? And, the, and I have this core and the, I need to do something with the core because I don't want to throw in the trash, right? Um, I would probably think about using it for dessert, okay? And maybe doing um, uh, white chocolate and cauliflower together um, because cauliflower is hidden. 
So what's nice is like if you use like if you use cauliflower and white chocolate, that white chocolate's gonna it's gonna override it. But what's nice is it can stretch it, so it can actually lower your uh, your custard cost too. So I think I think the the best way to explain it is I try to think about every single element. It's like guest uh, cost, and it's tough at times. I'm gonna be honest with you. It'll be tough at times because sometimes you'll be you'll want to do something, but it's either gonna it, it usually comes down to a cost factor or an execution factor depending what kitchen you're in. So, um, but I think that it's really the inspiration I get is just I'm really inspired by farmers. You know, um, I, I travel um, to a lot of farms. I do a lot of meat cuttings and stuff like that. And um, it's nothing like going out to the middle of nowhere and you see a 16-year-old, you know, boy or girl churning butter on the front porch. You're like, this is real. And you don't realize that, uh, you know, we're, we're not exposed to that every day. You know, we don't see it on the news. It's not blasted on the internet. And, um, when you see these kids doing these things, and you see these other farmers working really, really hard, you know how they live, and you know how passionate they are about their food. Um, when you bring it into your kitchen, I could be, you know, in the sink just washing the ingredient off, and I'm, I can think about him picking that, you know. And I think that that's the thing that really connects me to uh, want to you know, take this product and really follow through with it. So yeah. Any other questions so far? We good? I can't believe there's no questions. When I was sitting there, I had all kinds of questions. I still have questions. All right, I'll, say, I'll have questions for you later, Chef. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so let's, let's talk about um, Let's talk about professionalism, okay? Um, you know, I don't know, but culinary school, you know, we're, we're, everybody's very professional and things are going well, and then you, you get out in the real world and you experience people that are not professional and you experience people that are. Sometimes it can rub off. Sometimes someone can make you unprofessional. It's all about who you surround yourself with. but. The thing is, is that what I want everybody to focus on is, is yourself. You know, when you go into a restaurant, what you're going to do, what you're going to accomplish, you know, how are you going to approach yourself? How are you going to handle yourself? Um, how are you going to carry yourself? Um, negativity should not be in the kitchen. Um, who gets tired of doing a lot of prep? Does anybody get tired of doing a lot of prep? All right. Yeah, y'all need to calm down already no y'all need to calm down y'all ain't even seen prep yet y'all haven't seen prep yet um the only reason why i say that is because uh restaurants are going to continue to be busier uh at the end of the day food has to be done we cook only thing i can say is just stay passionate throughout the day and um you know every day is a new day you know when you you can accomplish one thing one day and, and be very very successful and the next day you could battle a different experience you know, um, be interesting if you're working garmage and your cooler goes down. Hey, chef, cooler's down. It's a different day. You weren't as successful that day as you were the day before. And there's things about that that, you know, I want everybody to understand is, is trying to follow through every single day. Um, you know, yes, chef is always a, a huge thing. I think that everybody needs to say yes, chef, no, chef. I think it's um, something that should definitely not die. Um, Everybody focus on um, making mistakes. Don't be scared, okay? Don't be scared. I watch, um, I did it myself. You go ahead, you're scared of season, okay? A little example, stay home. Stay home one night a week, maybe twice a week. One example is this, is that one thing that's not gonna help you become scared is uh, go ahead and go get five salts, okay? After you get five salts, get a smoke salt, get, you know, Murray River Red, you know, a Hawaiian Red, you get smoke salt, Malden salt, okay? Go ahead and get some salts, all right? What you need to do is you need to get a quart or a big cup. I drink out of quarts at home. Yep. So, um, but you can go ahead and uh, get a big thing of water and taste these different salts 
at home. You're sitting down, just taste this a little bit, just to taste it so you can understand. And eat a lot, you know, eat a lot and work a lot. And that's what's going to get you there. Because that's what's going to build your palate. You know, um, building your palate is, that's, I think that's the hardest thing. Who eats fast food in here? Everybody eats fast food, right? Because everybody's on a budget, right? Yeah, y'all, y'all need to be careful with that. Seriously. Um, the reason why is, is, is because you can actually um, eat cheaper um, if you would buy one thing and play around with it at home. It'd be cheaper than that fast food. At the same time, you're not, um, you're not teasing your palate, okay? When you eat fast food, you are putting um, modified sodium, uh, modified corn, okay, and modified sugar, okay, on your palate constantly, okay? The study just came out, said that uh, the new millennials is uh, out of is 50, uh, excuse me, there's 54% of people, um, the, the new millennials, so basically you, you all, is saying that, um, you know, you all are foodies. And 46% eat fast food four days, excuse me, four meals a week. So if you, eat, if you eat fast food four meals a week and you call yourself a foodie, it's interesting. Um, you're a chef to train yourself to be a chef. Uh, if, you're, if you're writing about food, if you want to become a food writer, right, you still have to understand how to eat, what to look for, right? Um, if you want to run a dairy plant, you still have to taste so no matter what in this business, that's something that technology cannot take away from us is taste. There's computer programs out there that are putting together dishes now, and, but they can't taste. So um, that is going to help you build your confidence. Doing all this it helps build your confidence, and uh, confidence is cooking. The more confident you are, the better cook you're going to be. Yes, ma'am. You know, uh, that's actually a very, very qu- good question. When I, was, um, when I was 18 years old, I worked for a lady named Priscilla Jackson. And Priscilla Jackson, uh, she told me that I always need to be careful who I study from. She's like, be careful because you will be doing things 10 years later that you don't realize that's a bad habit until you're there. Okay? And on, on top of that is that, uh, you know, I think that it's, it, it's, uh, it's about building a culture. And I think that what it, what it is is everybody is trying to find a job, right? And if you're trying to find a job, try to pick the job that's going to fit you. And what I mean is everybody's always on the phone. I bet y'all on the phone all the time. I bet you guys got to get on to them all the time about being on the phone, right? Some? Not too bad? Well, that's good. That's good. I, I, I got to tell everybody to put it up. But everybody's on the phone. Everybody knows technology and you're always looking things up all the time, if you find out, do some research, find out where you want to work and go into that culture that's really going to, you know, fit. For me, personally, I build that culture. So what I do is I don't expect everybody to come into my kitchen and have a foundation um, or, or, or build, excuse me, build, have built a relationship stronger than myself on cauliflower because I'm constantly, I'm constantly building a relationship with every single ingredient that I work with. So, for, for basically the answer to the question is, is, you know, come to my kitchen. <laughs> That's all, come to my kitchen, I'm serious. I, I mean, I, will, um, I, I teach, I teach every day, you know. Um, it's, and you know, you're gonna find yourself in situations too, and I will point this out too. You're always going to work next to someone that doesn't care. You always will. I don't care what kitchen you're in. I don't care if you are at, I don't care if you go to Chicago and you're working at a really awesome restaurant. There's always one person that just doesn't care. They, they're not going to care like you do. It's just, it's just, it's just the way it is. It's life, you know. Um, when that happens, um, you, you focus you focus on yourself, but you also focus on situations. And what I mean by that is because when you become more observant, you can actually take care of 
things that are going to go down before it goes down. You know, it's like if you see this person not caring and they're not handling the ingredients right, you may be able to go over there and help them. And if they don't care, well, they'll just get passed up. There's a reason why there will always be line cooks, there are always going to be sous chefs, and there's always going to be chefs. There's o it's always. There's always going to be somebody that, you know, they're, they're extremely talented, but their attitude's not there, and they're going to be a line cook for about 10 more years because of their attitude. And that's pretty much what it comes down to. I don't care how talented that you are. I, I, I mean, my sous chef right now currently started out as a dishwasher. And it's extremely hard to be my sous chef because if anything, if there's a crumb on the table, I'm like, excuse me, why is that there? You know, I'm, I'm real, real bad. I'm, I'm very, very, very OCD. Um, but he made it from a dishwasher all the way to being my sous chef because he is probably one of the hardest young men that I've worked with. I mean, he's 26 years old and in two years went from a dishwasher to my sous chef. And now he's running my restaurant and I'm, now he's just doing business. He's cooking, but he's knowing numbers. You know, he gets excited, he's like, chef. And I'll be like, yes, sir. And he's like, I flexed really good this week. I'm like, oh yeah. He's like, yeah, I'd, I only spent two grand. And I'm like, all right, good. You know, and it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to see people um, passionate and, and grow and, and be, you know, continue excited about it. Questions? Food? Oh, that's my next topic. Um, okay, so I do. I, um, I get my food. Um, I don't believe in using 100% local. Um, I believe in ingredients. So if, if ingredient is grown local and it's absolutely delicious, I want it all. Okay. Um, but it's all about, it's really all about just the ingredient, you know, um, how tasty is this ingredient? How versatile is it? Um, and cost, you know, a lot of it comes down to cost. I mean, I still buy my lamb from, um, Border Springs Farm and Patrick Springs, Virginia. That's a cool site to look up. If you ever want to like check out some cool lamb, um, this guy is an older man. He's a Harvard grad, and um, he's also a uh, Virginia, West Virginia grad as well. But he does, um, he raises lamb, and it's absolutely phenomenal. And he throws this big, like, almost like a Woodstock type deal, you know? <laughs> and uh, it's fun. We basically, I go there usually once a year, and I, I break down uh, lamb, every cut of lamb, and I bring all my cast iron out and I cook back like I would, like, I try to imagine how people would cook back in the early 1900s. And so I sleep in a tent and I cook for three days straight. And I drink too. But, um, <laughs> so, so, uh, but no, the, the, the lamb, um, I, it's expensive. But I still get just lamb from, but I buy it whole. Okay, so when something's expensive, then you gotta look at the next step. And, and really think about how much it's gonna be because we just, uh, we're working with um, Marksbury Farm, which is local. They're about two hours and 15 minutes away. And um, they are breaking down um, beef for us, for our restaurant group. And um, you know, it's sitting at like three and a half, three, you know, $3.55 a pound for the whole thing. Uh, and our hogs are, um, you know, $2.35 a pound for the whole thing. So we get, we're getting a great quality product um, for an inexpensive price. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Excuse me? Oh, it's, it is a lot of stuff. I mean, we do, uh, we try to stay with our, uh, the French, um, bistro, the, the classics. We do a lot of classic food, which is kind of fun. Uh, but we also twist it, so we'll do stuff like we'll do escargot, you know, we'll do um, we'll do a braised pork belly that shows a little more southern roots. Um, we'll also do, we'll do a lot of braised meats and a lot of custards for desserts. Yes. 
Yeah, fiddleheads. <laughs> I don't like fiddleheads. I don't care if it shows spring or not. I mean, fiddleheads. I did a, um, I did a battle one time with fiddleheads. It was a chef competition down in Nashville, and it's me against four of the chefs, and uh, it's at a Titan Stadium. And um, and they said the secret ingredient was fiddleheads. And they're like, then the secret ingredient is, and I was just like, oh man. So yeah, uh, that's the only thing. That's the only thing I don't like. Yes. Have you ever gone like, out of the United States to get more job experience for your food? Uh, just Italy. Just Italy. Just for, um, just for a short time. But um, yeah, it was, it's inspirational. But there's a lot going on in the United States. Um, you know, there's a lot going on in Nashville. I mean, we're opening up a restaurant in Nashville. Um, so I think that that's, that's definitely, you know, something to lean towards is, you know, going to, um, you know, Nashville, Chicago, Atlanta. Um, I have a couple of mentors in Atlanta as well that are really, really talented. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could stay in the United States and see a lot of things now. So, unless you want to go to Spain. Yes, sir. Oh, no, I got lucky. Um, no, no, actually, you know, what, what happened was it's, 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 it comes down to work ethic. What happened was is that um, I went ahead, uh, you know, how, how basically I, I started with, with the restaurant was that I started working really, really hard, and um, they gave me a piece of the restaurant. And then after that, uh, it got better because... Um, now they gave me a piece of the whole thing. So now I get a piece of every restaurant that I open up from this point on. And it's really all because of work ethic. That is it. I mean, and that's why I say if, if you come from, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't come from money. Um, and I've just been working hard um, pretty much all my life. And it's, it's paid off, you know, um, and it's continuing to pay off. I mean, I'm not done yet. You know I mean? I had two restaurants to open up this year and it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be intense and I'll, I'll be working 16 hour days forever um, but I don't really feel like I work a day in my life to be honest with you I mean I, I get tired but I don't really feel like I work if that makes sense and let's have to babysit babysitting is the only thing that makes me feel like I gotta work <laughs> so yeah <laughs> yes sir we do some um, you know we do it depends you know that's a good subject gosh it's good um so charcuterie all right so Charcuterie should be done in culinary school one, which it is. Uh, but when you leave, you have to be careful. I have walked into too many restaurants where I've eaten bad charcuterie and it's not handled right. Now, I'm not going to discuss what restaurants it was, but um, I don't like to walk into a restaurant and see bad mold on charcuterie. And so I will say, you got to just, for example, just be very, very careful. You know, I would, I would study it for a long time before you try to execute it. So, but we do some, yes. Usually um, we do a, uh, basically the, the only one that we're doing in house right now is we do a soprasada. And a soprasada I like because it's comfortable, it's safe, um, but it's tasty. And it's not like I'm trying to do something that I am not able to do in the environment that I'm in. So, yeah, yes. Okay, um, right now I use Choice um, at Le Coupe, um, but we have short rib, we basically just have a short rib on the menu and we have a hanger steak. Um, that's pretty much what you use as far as beef goes. Um, as far as the chicken goes, we use Mark Berry's Farm, you know, stuff like that through our menu at Le Coupe. But for Nashville, it would be different. I'm going with Prime and Choice in, in Nashville. We're doing a, uh, we just got it, we got a customized 1600 degree broiler, about 400 degrees more than the average. And it's, um, and all our steaks are basically about 28 ounces or bigger. Yeah. But it's all, it's all a share play concept. So what the idea behind it is that you can come in and you can have, um, you know, small plates that are $20 and less. And then at the same time, focusing on two, three, four people splitting a steak. So you don't have to spend 
all your money. <laughs> so yeah. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Um, uh, Sunday. <clears throat> yeah, Sunday. I see my wife on Sunday. Yeah. I don't see her. Um, I don't see her. I, I come home, she's asleep. It's a challenge, you know. It, it, I, I, I think that, um, I think it's a, it's just a constant challenge. It's not, um, it's not easy. It's just that simple. It's, it's not easy. I mean, um, but it's a lifestyle. I don't think that this, this, uh, this business to me personally is not really a, a career or a job. Um, it's a lifestyle. Yeah. I can't hear you. Oh, ethnic cooking. Um, I mean, I love, I, I, you know, personally, I love cooking Italian food. Um, I love making pasta. I love making gnocchi. Gnocchi is probably my number one favorite dish to make for people. Um, but at the same time, uh, I do love Latin food, too. You know, so, yeah, those are the two. But, yeah, I would say gnocchi. Sure. Any other questions? Yes. During the time when you said you only had 11 days off in two years, did you spend days that you were also working, still going out to the bar, there, seeing their sites still? Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, you know, it, I think that's a, it's just, it's, it's constant. You know, it's when you're trying to, when you're trying to build a relationship with food and you're trying to um, focus on your restaurant and make sure that your restaurant's making money. Um, so it takes a lot of time, a lot of dedication, a lot of dedication. So yeah. Anybody else? Good? Okay. Um, I do want to uh, talk about just a couple more things is that um, I do, uh, one thing that w you were talking about earlier was uh, the ingredients I use in, in local and me talking about local. The reason why I say this is because um, the coffee that we drink, the sodas we drink is not local. We have no idea where that comes from. Um, and then, you know, also uh, one last thing is, is that, um, you know, to always have uh, tape and Sharpie on you at all times. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the next thing here. Okay. Next thing, let's move back to the food. No, you're fine. You're fine. No, no, you're good. Um, we're going to go ahead and move, to, move on to this soup again. Okay, so this is the last thing that we're going to talk about as far as food. So all this is, this is basically cauliflower with vegetable stock, heavy cream, and thyme. That's it. It's that simple. Okay? It's cauliflower, heavy cream, vegetable stock, and thyme. Okay, it's got four ingredients. Okay. What we did is we finished it. We finished it with uh, the roasted cauliflower, the pickled cauliflower, and we also have a fried chickpea as well. Okay, and that is so everything actually comes back together. Okay. So, so next is that with this is that what I want everybody to understand is the 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 focus from the beginning to the end. Okay, understand what raw cauliflower tastes like or a raw ingredient. It doesn't have to be cauliflower, okay? A raw ingredient. What it tastes like at another stage, whether it be roasted, fried, okay, um, pickled, and then also how you can execute it in a sauce, custard, or soup, and then bringing it, everything together, okay? Does anybody have any questions about that, about the soup? <laughs> it is drinking. It's drinking. Yes, sir. So, what made you think that making a soup would bring all these three different colors? Uh, 
it's um it's really lifting it. It's um you know the number one thing was to show the idea behind several different techniques of cauliflower, but then also showing you that this soup that already has life can be lifted by just some garnishing of the cauliflower. So, yeah. Yes. Um, you know it's um. It really started out with my past. My past was uh, taking an ingredient and, um, you know, something that I did not mention earlier was when I opened up my first restaurant, um, that's really when it hit me about finances. And it was, well, how am I going to wow people and cook for people and still make money? Um, and so what I started doing is I kind of fell into the niche of trying to figure out how to do several t techniques with different things throughout the menu. And what I wanted to showcase cauliflower today was basically just to study and get everybody focused on vegetable cookery. Because vegetable cookery is so, so important. Um, you know, people want, uh, they want healthier options now. Um, and then you're also dealing with um, inexpensive ingredients that you can do a lot with. So yeah, yes. Um, on this cauliflower? Well, this cauliflower is, um, this cauliflower is actually year round. Okay. Um, and then you have a, it's nice cause you have a winter cauliflower, you have a spring cauliflower. So it's, it's definitely, you can't, you can't find, you can't find the, the, the colored cauliflower all year long. Yes. Yes. Yep. Anything else? Okay. So, um, one last thing is chef coats. Uh, the only thing that I will suggest is that every single day, please, 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 make sure that the, all your coats are pressed very clean. Okay, it's not really, for, you're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for your guests. That's the most important, okay? Um, guests can see everything. And remember that there's always somebody watching you. There's always somebody watching you. And you see how many open kitchens there are today. You used to not be like that. Now there's open kitchens everywhere and they see everything. You know, watch, watch when you eat in public, you know? It's always nice to kind of kneel down, you know? It's true. You gotta kneel down, take a drink of water, kneel down, snack, you know, because people, it's, a, it's kind of a turn off psychologically to some people, you know, see people eating in front of, you know, same people that are cooking their food are just, you know, mowing on food, so, yeah. But that's, that's pretty much the last thing that I have. Um, I just want, I want to thank you all for your time today. And, um, and I, it's, it's just, it's been uh, just an excitement to be here and, um, and share some things with you. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.